I'm feeling a bit chilly. Let's, uh, let's use some engineering to help control heat transfer. Ah, ah, much better. Added something to insulate my hand. Now, I'll just uh, proceed with my lecture. Oh, oh God, nah, that's not gonna work. Never mind. Ah, this is a little better. Let's talk about heat transfer today. So, what's the plan? We're gonna start our discussion of heat transfer. And, you know, why are we talking about heat transfer? Well, you know, most biological things either produce heat um, through metabolic processes or need to be controlled um, at very careful, uh, careful chemical, uh, need to be controlled in temperature to either remain alive or for chemical processes, you know, to produce precise reactions at precise rates. So heat transfer is super duper important um, in bioengineering contexts. So when we talk about heat transfer, um, we're gonna we're gonna cover a handful of topics today. We're going to top, we're gonna discuss the three forms or modes of heat transfer: convection or conduction, convection, conduction, convection, and radiation. So we're gonna talk about those three modes, uh, what they are, make distinctions between them. And for, uh, for, the, for the next several lectures, we're gonna be most, mostly focusing on uh, conduction. And for the rest of this lecture in particular, we're gonna focus on conduction. We're gonna define a few new terms um, to sort of, you know, we, we all have qualitative understandings of what heat transfer is, but we're gonna define a few new terms to help model these things mathematically um, and when modeling things mathematically, we need to be precise with our language. So we're going to talk about heat flow, heat flux, temperature gradients, and temperature distributions. We're going to talk about these four terms, you know, how these are different, how these are different, you know, how they relate to each other in certain ways. Then we're going to talk about Fourier's law of conduction. Which will help bring some of these quantities um, in a mathematical relation to one another. One of the key parameters in Fourier's law, uh, Fourier's law of conduction is the thermal conductivity. So this, you know, this essentially follows from that, and we're going to talk about, you know, what are some ranges of thermal conductivities that we can see for various materials. So this is going to sort of be mostly like the theory introduction-y stuff. Then I'm going to do two example problems, which will employ some of the, um, which will employ some of these concepts and some of these terms that we're talking about here. Uh, one example problem is we're going to uh, derive the temperature distribution. within a wall. So we're gonna have a hot side of the wall and a cold side of the wall, and we're gonna see, you know, how does temperature vary within the wall? So, you know, we're, we're essentially figuring out spatial distributions of temperature. Temperature is a function of x, for example, where x is the, what position we are within the thickness of the wall. Um, and we're going to then, we're gonna also do a similar, uh, a similar derivation for deriving the temperature distribution within the wall of a pipe. And of course, if the wall of the pipe is, has very thin walls, it's you know not too different from just any sort of wall, but if the wall of a pipe sort of has thick walls, we get a different thing. And basically the key thing here, you know, is essentially temperature as a function of R. It turns out things get a little bit tricky when you're in cylindrical coordinates as opposed to Cartesian coordinates, so uh, we'll talk about those distinctions. And then finally, um, you know, sometimes we, you know, we care a lot about temperature distributions, but a lot of times in engineering we just care about, you know, the temperature on one side versus the temperature on another. We don't care about the details of what happens in the middle. And um, we just care maybe, for example, about temperature differences and heat flows. 
So formulating things that way, um, there's this idea of thermal resistances. And it turns out that thermal resistances will sort of uh, have similar um, kind of algebraic relationships to what we talked about fluidic resistances or electrical resistances um, earlier in the class. You know, there are basically thermal resistances where we can um, where we can kind of um, you know we can draw analogies to similar to problem solving strategies we've talked about earlier. So this is the plan for what we're going to talk about today. Let's get started talking about the three modes of heat transfer. So let's get started on the three modes. So first we'll talk about conduction. And of course we all know that you know certain materials conduct heat, right? If you ever stick your spoon um, in a hot cup of tea, you know after a little while, eventually the the part that you're touching will feel very warm, you know something like that. So. Uh, we all know we add insulation to the walls of our houses to help reduce um, our heating bills, you know, reduce the amount of time that the furnace needs to be on um, in order to have that heat leaving, or, you know, conversely, heat entering our homes uh, via, uh, and save on air conditioning in the summer. So, so you know, what, is, what does this deal with conduction? Well, if we zoom in on an atomic level, heat is basically just uh, vibrations or um, uh, motions of individual atoms. So heat, you know, heat is basically just motion of atoms and if one atom is wiggling a lot and there's some neighbor atom that's not wiggling as much, eventually this atom is going to be bumping into its neighbor or if it's in some, some structure basically its jiggling will start will start the neighbor jiggling as well. And then when this neighbor starts jiggling, this one will start jiggling as well. And eventually, you know, whatever energy, whatever energy due to motion that this atom had, eventually that, that energy gets shared among all of its neighbors. So heat, you know, heat isn't really some thing that I could pick up or show you. Heat is essentially this motion. And because the motion gets transmitted and shared among its neighbors, um, you know, we can think of it as sort of a quantity of itself that flows, even though it's it's not really a material itself, it's just the, the, the motion of atoms, right? So atoms vibrate, they share that energy with their neighbors, um, and this sharing is local. Right, so basically these atoms can, can share, can share things locally. And the, the heat, i.e. this um, vibration of atoms, can be said to flow, uh, you know, it, the, the things that are moving a lot share their things with their neighbors that aren't moving as much, and in a sense, heat the heat flows from hot to cold. And this heat flows, this heat flows even though macroscopically these atoms aren't really moving much other than their sort of local space, right? So it's not like a hot atom jumps all the way to the cold side and then starts vibrating over there. No, its vibration is transmitted even though the atoms themselves are not. We can contrast this to convection, which is basically heat transfer from a solid surface to fluid. And so if I have some solid surface here that's, let's say, hot, The atoms on the on the surface might be wiggling a lot, and there might be some fluid around where the atoms in that fluid aren't wiggling as much. Well, that heat can get transmitted from the solid to the fluid, fluid up here, and then if that fluid is moving, um, we basically have this case where we have not not so vibrationy fluid atoms coming in heating up against the surface and then leaving, right? So we can have convection, which is basically the fluidy part. So conduction, you know, um, I, I don't want to make this, this, this isn't a total, total rigorous, um, you know, case, but usually when we're talking about conduction, it's usually solids. And when we're talking about convection, it's usually from a solid surface to a fluid. But, I mean, we can have 
can, we can have convective heat transfer from fluids to fluids, and we can also have conduction within fluids that, as long as the fluid is stationary. So, you know, these aren't hard and fast rules, but this is, you know, this is generally what we're talking about in terms of processes, right? So, but what's the key thing, difference between conduction and convection? You know, convection, I have a fluid comes in, and then that fluid physically leaves carrying some heat with it. Right, so when we're talking about convection, you know that heat is transferred not just locally atom to atom, but also from some macroscopic motion of fluid. So macroscopic motion of the fluid contributes to the heat transfer. And then finally, the last mode of heat transfer in the trio is radiation. And we're not just talking about, you know, your, your Fallout New Vegas type of radiation. Uh, we're talking about um, electromagnetic radiation, some of which could be damaging to us, but some of which, you know, is, you know, what we encounter in our everyday lives. So radiation, I basically have some atom in some place, and when atoms vibrate, they emit photons, um, and those photons can go, you know, far away, right? You know, the photons from our, from our sun, you know, take... I don't know, eight minutes to get to us, right? So photon, so something, you know, some atom moves and due to its motion, it kicks off a photon. That photon travels at the speed of light, C, through space, and then, you know, couples strongly to some other um, atom and that, you know, transmits that energy to that other atom, which then, you know, causes it to move or causes its electron orbitals to shift or, or whatever, right? So when we're talking about radiation, um, you know, this radiation can occur over very long distances. So it can, you know, this radiation can occur over, you know, um, light, like light years, so to speak, right? So radiation, you know, can be long distance. Um, but if we're talking about radiation, radiation really, um, really only happens when things are like glowing hot, right? You've, you've always, you know, you've seen like in the movies, you know, the blacksmith takes the sorge out of the forge and like it's glowing red hot or something like that. You know, under circumstances like that, we typically have appreciable amounts of heat transfer due to radiation, but mostly in our everyday lives, particularly in bioengineering applications. You know, I don't know of too many bioorganisms that are glowing red hot. So mostly in bioengineering, we're dealing with conduction and convection as I'm gonna focus in this class, right? So conduction and convection will be the focus of this class. And if you wanna talk about radiation, sorry, you're out of luck. All right, so uh, so these are the three, the three modes of heat transfer that engineers um, uh, model our heat transfer processes on, and we're gonna focus on two of them in this class in general and one of them in particular, conduction, today. So, let's define some new terminology. Let's now talk about heat flows, heat fluxes, temperature gradients, and temperature distributions. And that will set the stage for our discussion of Fourier's law of conduction. So when we talk about heat flows, We're talking about rates of energy transfer. So rates imply that it's going to have something, you know, something per second. And energy, well, the energy, the, the units of energy, if we're dealing with SI units, are going to be joules, right? So rates is going to be something, something over time. And if we're talking about energy, that's gonna be in units of joules. So if we're talking about heat flows, these heat flows are rates of energy transfer, and in particular rates of thermal, thermal energy transfer. Rates of thermal energy transfer are going to be joules per unit time. So if we're talking units, it's gonna be joules per second. A joule per second has a slightly more familiar name that you might have seen before. Um, it might be the watt or which we would abbreviate with a capital W um, in SI units. So a watt is a joule per second, and 
in this sense, this heat, a heat flow, is something that we measure in watts. We might contrast this to a heat flux. And a heat flux is basically a heat flow per unit area. So what do I what do I mean by heat flow per unit area? Well, let's let's picture a wall. Let's picture a wall, right? And let's say on one side of the wall, it's really hot. And then on the other side of the wall, the other side of the wall is really cold. Right, so I have a hot side and a cold side of my wall. If I wanted to say heat, uh, if I wanted to talk about a heat flow, this would be how much, how many watts per second. Or I get, no, sorry, how many watts, which would be joules per second. How many, how many watts go through the whole wall? And I might contrast this to a heat flux, which is basically how many watts go through how many watts go through each square meter of wall. So, uh, so this, that's the contrast between heat flows and heat flux. And of course, we could go back and forth between the two by multiplying by area, right? So we can go back and forth between heat flow and heat flux by multiplying by area. Or if heat flux is non-uniform, we would integrate the heat flow across the area, right? So we can go back and forth by by relating the two by multiplying heat flux times an area would give us a heat flow. So um, let's, let's put down a few variables that we use to commonly stand for these quantities. All right, so, so when we talk about heat flows, you know, I'm talking about rates of energy transfer. In a sense, I'm talking about the motion of little packets of energy, right? I'm talking about, you know, uh, each the, mo the sort of flow, you know, these, these joules are all moving from one place to another. So for heat flows, I basically need to, to specify a direction, right? So heat flows, I usually use, use capital Q for, for heat flows. And you know we already used Qs for volumetric flow rates, so uh, that's why I tried to put the subscript V earlier in the class for a volumetric flow rate to distinguish it from a heat flow. Um, I think what I'll what I'll try to do in this class is I'll uh, is I'll try to keep Qs. I'll put a little dot above the Q. Sometimes people put dots above things. Sometimes Qs represent the energy. And Q dot would represent a, a rate. So sometimes sometimes people sort of signify some, that something is a rate by putting a dot on top of it. I'll do that um, as often as I can, but I, I don't know. Nomenclature is kind of messy for these things, so sometimes you need to pick it up from context. But what I won't, um, but, I, but, but what I'll be very sure to make sure, what I'll be very sure to do every time is give this a subscript. So oftentimes the subscript denotes the direction of heat flow. So this basically denotes. This basically denotes the direction, right? So, so what would I mean? You know, so what would I have here? Well, you know, for this wall, I might define some coordinate system where x, you know, is a position where x equals zero starts on, let's say, one side of the wall, and x describes our position within the wall. So, I'd say qx is basically the direction of heat flow. Uh, qx is the heat flow um, that's kind of traveling in the x direction through the wall. And hypothetically, we could also have heat flows traveling in other directions, y and z as well, right? So we need to, so we need to often make a distinction, you know, what, uh, what direction of heat flow I'm talking about. So the subscript x basically denotes direction. So, you know, I might say, hey, there's some heat flow going through this wall, and I might say it has some, some, uh, 
some q dots of x is what I would use to describe the heat flow. Similarly, um, I could I could uh, have a heat flux, and basically, you know, I could say, hey, I'm going to break up this wall into a bunch of, uh, you know, into a bunch of little individual units as this cross section. I'm going to say, hey, each unit, you know, there's there's a heat flow, but that heat flow is divided up across the whole area of the wall, and each little area of the wall has some amount of heat. You know, there's some amount of heat flow per unit area. And the heat flow per unit area is oftentimes given a lowercase q. So capital Qs are heat flows, lowercase qs are heat fluxes. Um, and you know, heat flux has a direction in the same way that a heat flow does. So we give subs, we give heat fluxes directions as well. So if I think about heat flows, they basically have units of joules per second or watts. If I think about heat fluxes, it's joules per second meters squared, um, or almost always, you know, people almost always talk about heat fluxes in terms of watts per meter squared, right? So this is really the preferred unit for heat flows, and usually watts is the preferred unit for, I'm uh, sorry, watts per meter squared is the preferred units for heat fluxes, watts is the preferred units for heat flows. So there we have it. Finally, um, let's talk a little bit about temperature gradients and temperature distributions, right? So, um, so first let's talk about temperature distributions. Believe it or not, everything in the world is not at the same temperature. Temperature varies spatially, right? So temp Right? Not everything in the world is at the same temperature, right? And, and if we're looking at this case where we maybe have a hot side and a cold side of the wall, um, I might say, hey, you know, temperature might vary as a function of um, as a function of position in this wall, and also, you know, temp temperature can vary temporally too. Right? So in general, temperature is basically, you know, could be a function of x, y, z, and time. Oftentimes, we restrict our analysis to problems where maybe temperature is only a function of x, or maybe temperature is only a function of time, or something like that. Um, but you know, but in general, temperature could sort of vary in these things. So if we're talking, you know, if someone says, "Hey, what's the temperature distribution?" They're looking for they're looking for you to give them this function, this temperature as a function of of space of space and time. So if someone asks you for a temperature distribution, or someone gives you a temperature distribution, you can expect that they're saying, hey, what is this function? What is this temperature as a function of spatial and time variables? Um, a te temperature gradient is a derivative of your, of your temperature function with respect to a spatial variable. So remember how we talked about velocity. So we talked about, so if we want to draw analogies, a temperature distribution is analogous to a velocity profile. A temperature gradient is analogous to a velocity gradient. So what do I mean by temperature gradient? You know, uh, for example, a temperature gradient might be dt dx or dt dy. Or if you're in some cylindrical coordinates, maybe you could say like dt dr or something like that, right? So if I'm talking about temperature gradients, I'm talking about a derivative of temperature with uh, with respect to a spatial variable. And you could imagine, you know, some of these, any of these would basically be the slope of like a t of x curve, right? So I guess you know dt dx would essentially be the slope. Of a, of a t of x curve, or dt dr would be a function of a, of a t versus r curve. Right? So temperature gradients, the higher the temperature gradient, the more rapidly temperature is varying um, if you change your spatial position within some material. So four key definitions to, uh, four key definitions to consider when we're talking about heat transfer in a particular conduction, heat flows, which would be in watts, heat fluxes, which would be in watts per meter squared. Temperature, which usually we do in degrees C or Kelvin if we use grown up SI units. Um, and a temperature gradient, which would basically be in, which would have units of 
kelvins per meter, right? Temperature uh, dt dx would be kelvins per meter. So, um, so these uh, these are these are four terms that I'm going to throw around a lot, and you know we basically need to consider very carefully when we're doing heat transfer problems. So you know there are relationships between these things. There are relationships between heat flows and heat fluxes, temp distributions and temp gradients. Um, so so let's kind of put some of that together. So the relationships between heat flows and heat fluxes, I you know I said was related to area. So we could basically say you know a qx is going to basically be equal to a, uh, a little qx times the cross-sectional area that that the heat is flowing through, right? So in a you know um, in a way that like uh, watts, this would have units of watts. This would have units of watts per meter squared. The cross-sectional area is basically the area. You know, if I'm talking about cross-sectional area, I'm basically saying, hey, you know, what is the area? What is the area of the face? that is sort of normal to the direction of flow, right? So cross-sectional area is basically what I'm talking about here. What is the area of this face that, that the heat is sort of flowing perpendicularly to? And of course, that's going to have units of meters squared, right? So we can see that um, all of this stuff balances out, right? So that's the relationship between heat flows and heat fluxes. But you might ask, is there some, uh, and, that, and this is just sort of almost a purely geometrical or definitional sort of relationship. Um, but you might ask, you know, hey, is there some relationship between maybe like temperatures and some of these things, right? We, we know that if we want to make heat flow faster through something, we've got to heat up the hot side or cool down the cold side to make that heat flow faster, right? If you have a burn on your hand, you want to make the heat flow very quickly out of your hand, so you put ice on it, you know? So we, so we basically know that there's, you know, intuitively we know that there are relationships between temperatures and heat flows. So, you know, how do we describe this mathematically? Well, it turns out we describe the relationship between some of these things mathematically with Fourier's law of conduction. All right, so, uh, so what is Fourier's law of conduction? Well, Fourier's law of conduction is as follows. Um, it's sort of, it's defined for a heat flux, and it's basically saying, hey, the heat flux through this wall that we talked about earlier, you know, we have this wall here that we have some heat flow through, you know, or a heat flux per, per you know, this heat flux, which is the heat flow per unit area, this heat flux is proportional to a temperature gradient, right? So, so what do I mean? If I have my wall and I have a hot side and a cold side, the, the heat flux the heat flux through this wall is proportional to the temperature gradient in that wall. So the hotter I make the hot side or the colder I make the cold side, the more heat flux goes through. So heat flux is proportional to dt dx. Well, um, is it is it proportional? Well, it's it's proportional in a way, but it's actually proportional to negative the temperature gradient, right? So, w what does this mean? You know, dt dx. If I have a hot side and a cold side, my temperature, let's say, I plot temperature as a function of position. Here, temperature is going down. So, in this case, my dt dx is actually negative, right? My dt dx is less than zero. So, you know, basically because heat flux, you know, if I have heat flux in the positive x direction, that's associated with temperature going down. This minus sign here basically says, yeah, you know, heat flows, heat flows from hot to cold, but a temperature gradient, but a positive temperature gradient is moving from cold to hot. So heat flows from hot to cold. But, but positive dt dx is moving from cold to hot. So, um, so that so this negative sign basically um, accounts for this sort of flip flop in the definitions of 
you know, or our, our physical intuitions of how heat flows compared to sort of this definitional uh, idea of a temperature gradient. But anytime we have something that's proportional to something else, um, we can in introduce a proportionality constant. And in this case, the, pro the proportionality constant that we introduce is this thing called K. which is the thermal conductivity. All right, so what is K? K is the thermal conductivity. So K is the thermal conductivity. And take a moment now, pause and ponder. What are the units of K? Well, if you want to if you want to deal with the units, um, you think what are the units of heat flux? Well, heat flux is going to be watts per meter squared. If we think of what are, you know what are the units of dt dx, that's going to have units of kelvin per meter. So, what do the units of K need to be in order to work it out? It turns out that the units of K have to be watts per meter. Kelvin. And, you know, because because we have Kelvin, which is, you know, like a degree like quantity, and K, which is thermal conductivity, um, you know, these are both K's. So I'll try to use capital K for Kelvin. So capital K, which I'll try to put little like crosses on the bits will be Kelvin, which is a degree or a, temp a measure of temperature, and lowercase k will be thermal conductivity. So I'll try to keep those two k's different from one another so we don't get confused in class. So um, so what is, what is thermal conductivity? Thermal conductivity is this thing that gives proportionality between um, a temperature gradient and a heat flux. So the more the, the, more intense or the higher the magnitude of a temperature gradient, the higher the heat flux, or the higher the thermal conductivity, the higher the heat flux. Um, and as you might know, um, thermal conductivity is different f for different materials. So thermal conductivity, this is a material property. Different materials have different relationships between the temperature difference and and the heat flux. So for example, my glove, which, uh, you know, which try, which I want to, you know, out of convenience be thin, um, but out of comfort to be, uh, to, to allow minimal heat flow from my nice warm hands to the nice, uh, to the very cold outside, you know, I want to make my heat flux out of my hands as low as possible. So I choose gloves that are made of a material with low thermal conductivity such that for the given temperature gradient that exists between my hand and the outside, um, I, I try to get as low heat flux as possible, right? So K, so I want to choose gloves that have a, a material of low thermal conductivity. And the same argument could be made for, you know, any, any insulator that we want. So it turns out that um, thermal conductivities can actually vary by orders and orders of magnitude. So th there are um, a couple of materials now. So let's uh, let's build a little chart with some common thermal conductivities, just so you can sort of see the range of materials that, or the range of Ks that we might see. So uh, one of the best thermal conduct uh, thermal conductors is copper, and this basically has uh, four hundred watts per meter Kelvin for its thermal conductivity. Copper is basically one of the best thermal conductors out there. Um, we know that in general, metals are pretty good thermal conductors, right? You know, um, no one wants to, you know, no one wants to make gloves out of chain mail to keep their hands warm in the winter. Um, but it turns out that, you know, metals can actually vary appreciably in their thermal conductivity. So for example, um, the thermal conductivity of steel is actually almost an order of magnitude lower at just 54 watts per meter Kelvin. 
right? So all of you who like to have, you know, fancy gaming computers, those heat sinks are made out of copper. Even though steel would have been a little bit cheaper and a little more durable for those heat sinks, they try to get the good thermal performance from those heat sinks by having a high, a, a high thermal conductivity metal to basically leach the heat away from your CPU or graphics card um, to get that heat away as efficiently as possible. So if they made them out of steel, you know, they would have needed a much bigger heat sink in order to get the same amount um, of heat flow out. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's obviously a bunch of other materials out there, but oftentimes spongy or low density materials tend to be pretty good thermal insulators. So cork, you know, like the, the material that like wine corks are made out of, um, has a pretty low thermal conductivity, just 0 0.07 watts per meter Kelvin. And you might, uh, uh, and fiberglass, fiberglass insulation, right? Basically the, the pink stuff that you find in your, you know, in your attics or walls or things like that. Um, you know, that, that material has been specifically designed to have a very low um, thermal conductivity, 0 point, uh, 0 0.04 watts per meter Kelvin. So what does this mean? You know, between some of the materials that are best thermal conductors and some of the materials that are best thermal insulators, we have, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude, right? We have orders and orders of magnitude uh, between between really good thermal con uh, really good thermal conductors and really good thermal insulators, but basically all of these materials, regardless of what their K is, all of these materials follow Fourier's law of conduction. So we can have varying degrees of what K is, you know, varying differences in these thermal conductivities, but they all follow Fourier's law of conduction. That gives a relationship between a temperature gradient and a heat flux. So let's now do an example problem that involves Fourier's law of conduction, right? We just learned about it, let's practice using it. Um, and that basically incorporates thermal conductivity, um, although implicitly, and will derive the temperature distribution within this wall, right? So right now we know, hey, that you know, there's a hot side and the cold side. Let's say we wanted to figure out what, you know, what temperature is as a function of position within this wall. You know, if I put my x equals zero starting at the side of the wall, you know, what, what is this? How does, you know, we know that the hot side is hot and the cold side is cold, but, you know, what is, what does temperature look like? You know, what does temperature look like within the wall? What, what is this temperature, temperature distribution? So. So we're talking about temperature distribution in a wall. Let's say we have this wall right here. Let's define our coordinate system as x kind of starting with one side of the wall and going in. And let's sort of assume that this wall basically extends, you know, very a very long direction in z and in y as well. So we're not really concerned with any variations in y and z. We're basically just saying, hey, you know, we're only concerned with what go uh, with what's going on in x. So we, have, we want to look for this temperature distribution in a wall. We essentially want to derive what t, uh, what t of x is right here. So let's say we have some known temperature, uh, some known temperature t1 on this side of the wall. We have some known temperature t2 on this side of the wall. And let's, let's sort of assume that you know, the cross section, the cross section of this wall is uh, is very it's you know is pretty big relative to the thickness and is known its cross section is known let's say it has and let's say the wall has some known thickness l let's say the wall also has some known thermal conductivity k right so let's say you know we know the thermal conductivity we know the temperatures on the two sides of the wall we know the cross sectional area in the l and we're looking to derive what this temperature is as a function of x um, let's assume 
uh, let's assume a couple of things. Let's assume we're in steady state. So what do, what do I mean by steady state? Well, you could imagine like if, if this wall were sort of, you know, at some initial temperature and then all of a sudden instantly I put a blowtorch on it and raised this side of the wall up to T1, you know, the temperature profile might look like might look a little bit weird for a while while the wall itself is heating up and cooling down until it gets to what its, you know, steady state temperature difference is going to be between T1 and T2. So we're assuming we're sort of already at the steady state. I basically have some heater here that maintains the inside at T1. I have some cooling over here that maintains this side at T2. And, you know, nothing's, you know, other than this heat sort of flowing from hot to cold continuously, um, the, the temperature profiles, you know, it, within that wall isn't changing as a function of time. So there's basically you know, this, this steady state here. So, you know, so what does the steady state in here mean? I basically, you know, I have some, I have some, uh, some heat flow that's kind of flowing into one side of the part of the wall. And basically, uh, what do I mean by steady state? Basically, my heat flow is constant. Um, and, you know, because if my heat flow weren't constant, if, for example, I had more heat flowing into here, then throughout this, then through this point in the wall, the imbalance in those heat transfers would be causing this part of the wall to like heat up or cool down with time. But that's not happening. So basically, any heat that flows into one part of the wall must also flow other flow out um, in steady state. Uh, and that's basically you know saying my in my ins and outs are perfectly balancing, or this heat flow you know through any slice in the wall at any time is going to be constant. So, so here we have it. So although I know, uh, although, you know, I'm basically saying, hey, I'm assuming steady state, which is implying that this heat flow is constant, um, I don't know. It's, it's constant, but unknown. What is known are, are these temperatures, lengths, cross-sectional areas, and thermal conductivities, but the heat flow itself is unknown. All right, so, you know, how, how can we make progress towards getting this temperature distribution? Well. Um, I'm going to need, you know, I might be able to relate, you know, temperatures, heat flows, thermal conductivities, and some geometry. I might be able to relate these. So I can probably relate some of these things um, via via Fourier's law. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can work with that. So let's let's start working out uh, Fourier's law. So I have this as of yet unknown um, heat flux. And as Fourier's law was given, its heat flux is equal to minus thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient. Um, if, I, if I'm assuming, if I, if I assume that T varies only with x, Right, that I don't, you know, that like basically what's happening at this part in the wall is the same as what's happening down here or into or out of the page, which, you know, would be a pretty good assumption is if this wall is big. If I assume temperature varies only with x, I can replace these partial derivatives with ordinary derivatives. So I can basically say, hey, qx is going to be equal to minus k dt dx because temperature would be only a function of x, so these partial derivatives can be ordinary. All right, so this is basically saying here, um, I said my heat flow, you know, my heat flow into one part of the wall and outside of the other part of the wall is constant. If my heat flow is constant, well, I can try to relate heat flow to heat flux. My heat flow is equal to my heat flux times the cross-sectional area. Well, cross-sectional area is a constant, and this is a constant. We don't know what it is, but it's a constant. So that must mean this is also, also constant. It's an unknown constant, but it's, uh, but it's something that is constant. So what does this mean? This is a constant. This, this right here is some constant that's as of yet unknown, and we have a constant here. So what does this mean? This means my dt dx, this means this is constant, right? So constant. constant 
also also constant. Great. Um, that that's great. So what does this mean? Um, so we have this q sub x that's constant, but as of yet unknown. Um, but we can, you know, we can just treat it like a constant and hopefully resolve some of it later. So what does this mean? We have on our hands an equation. Um, we have, you know, a temperature gradient, but perhaps this temperature gradient we might be able to sort of put in terms of some of this stuff later on. So what can we do? We have a differential equation. We can integrate. Um, but before we integrate, we should separate variables. We can separate variables and integrate, right? So we can bring dt over to one side of the equation, and we can bring dx over to the other side of the equation. So what does that look like? Sorry, minus 1 over k. dx and we're going to have our q sub x we can integrate both sides but if these things are constants right this is a constant and this is a constant they those can pull those can be pulled out of out of the integral so when we integrate um, the left hand side we get t which is going to basically be our t of x and we have our 1 of minus 1 over k or I guess we could say minus it would be minus q sub x over k. And integral dx becomes x. So then what do I need? I need to add plus some as of yet unknown constant c1. And I guess I could treat, I mean I could treat qx as some as of yet unknown constant as well. So what do I have here? I basically have two unknowns. How do I go about resolving these unknowns? Pause and ponder. How to resolve? Well, uh, anytime we think about solving differential equations and getting constants of integration, we can resolve constants of integration with boundary conditions. Well, what boundary conditions do we have in this problem? Well, I know what the temperature is at x equals 0. I also know what the temperature is at x equals L. And uh, I can basically sub in those two boundary conditions to, to resolve these two unknowns. So at x equals 0, so at x equals 0, temperature is basically equal to T1. So that's basically saying, hey, T1 is equal to uh, minus Qx over K um, times 0 plus C1. So this pretty this uh, this pretty much gives it away that c1 has to be equal to t1, and at x equals l, the temperature is t2. So this basically says t2 is equal to minus q sub x over k times l. And we can sub in our, our C1, which is now our known T1. So what does this mean? This basically means our heat flux is going to be equal to T1 minus T2 times K over L. So now we've resolved our other unknown. So, uh, so um, what can we do? We can now sub this uh, back in. But before I sub this in, I want to kind of offer some physical intuitions for what this means, right? So, the higher, so so, what are some key physical different, uh, uh, some key physical distinctions? The higher the temp, the higher the 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 delta T more heat flux the higher the k more heat flux 
or the thinner the wall more heat m means more heat flux and you know why did I take out this glove well in the winter I like to wear nice thick gloves yeah I'm a dork when I do it but I like to wear nice thick gloves because these thick gloves these nice thick gloves basically have a very a very thick L and the bigger my L the smaller that heat flux is going to be out of my hands so that way I can maintain a nice, comfortable, toasty Delta T, keeping my fingers nice and warm, um, even when, you know, T2 outside is very chilly. So I choose gloves that have high, or sorry, if I have a very low thermal conductivity and have a very high thickness to basically suppress this heat flux as much as possible. So there we have it. Um, one last thing that we could consider is, you know, could could we put this in the context of our of our heat flow? So, I, you know, I could put our heat flow. I could, uh, and I could basically say, hey, this heat flow is equal to the heat flux times the cross sectional area, or T1 minus T2 times K over L uh, times the cross-sectional area. So furthermore, what I might want to do, you know, if I if I want to reduce the overall wattage leaving my body, you know, I can reduce By low, I can reduce heat loss by lowering cross-sectional area. So, for example, you know, if you're tiptoe, if you are walking across, you know, you get up in the middle of the night for a glass of water, and the and your kitchen floor, the tile on your kitchen floor is very cold. One thing you might consider doing is tiptoeing across that kitchen floor to try to to try to reduce the contact area between your toes and the floor to reduce the overall heat loss. Right. So you can if you can reduce heat loss by lowering your cross-sectional area um, to, uh, you know, by, to basically provide less of a path for heat to flow out of. Um, so, uh, so we have all this stuff. Well, wait, wait a second. Let's not get too distracted. Let's get back to our overall goal of deriving this temperature profile. Well, I, so I solved my uh, as of yet unknown heat flux. I put this in terms of known constants. I can plug this heat flux back into back into this result here so I can get my T of X and I can say that this is equal to minus T1 minus T2 times K over L um, over K right so this this K is is right here and this K is from the K that we had here times x plus t1. Turns out that, uh, interestingly enough, the k's actually cancel out. So what does this look like? What, what does this function look like? Take a moment now, pause and ponder. What to, you know, if you were to plot temperature, if you were to plot temperature as a function of position x, what would this look like? Well, this is basically, so hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. Hopefully uh, you've had a chance to, to basically see what this looks like. You know, this is basically the equation of a line. Um, and you know, what, is, what does this line look like? Well, if I evaluate it at x equals zero, I get t1 right here. If I evaluate it at x equals L, if I evaluate it at x equals L, I get, um, you know, L over L. So basically all this stuff cancels out. And then I get minus T1 minus T2 plus T1. So the minus T1s cancel and I get minus minus T2 or T2. So at x equals L, I get T2 right here. And this is the equation of a line. 
So this temperature as a function of x is basically a linear temperature distribution between t1 and t2. And I think that, you know, that fits with our reasoning, right? If I have t1 over here and t2 over here, you know, it's not unreasonable to say that the temperature varies linearly between them. That, you know, if I'm halfway through the wall, then I'm halfway from my temperature between t1 and t2. It's a reasonable result. So, success. We've done it. We've derived our temperature profile. So let's move on to the next uh, the next step that we're going to do. We derived our temperature distribution within the wall, um, T of x. Let's now figure out what the temperature distribution would be within the wall of a pipe, and in particular a pipe with thick walls. What's the temperature distribution within a wall of a pipe? So let me first just take a moment to kind of sketch sketch what I'm talking about right here. And then we can sort of talk about, you know, why we might care about this in bioengineering. So imagine I have um, a hollow cylinder. And it looks like this. So we, we might encounter the things like these all the time. You know, let's say I have a pipe and I'm flowing coolant through the pipe, and maybe I have some water bath on the outside that's at one temperature and some fluid on the inside that's another temperature. Maybe those two fluids basically prescribe um, two temperatures at the surfaces here, right? So maybe I have some T1, T1 on the inside temp, T1 on the inside, and maybe I have a T2 on the outside, on the outside surface, right? So, uh, so if I, and if these temperatures are different from one another, I'm basically going to have flow kind of outwards in the radial direction, right? So basically, my heat flow is going to flow kind of from the inside to the outside. So I'm basically going to have heat that's flowing. Let's, you know, let's say hypothetically for the time being that temperature T1 is higher than T2. I'm going to have heat that's flowing from the inside of the pipe through the solid wall of the pipe you know, out the outside, right? So I might call this Q, um, and I'm going to give it a Q dot sub R. And so, and basically, um, and, you know, I, I want to say, you know, hey, I, I want to know what this is. So our goal is to determine... Our goal is to determine this, um, and that, and that's in in terms of some kind of known given parameters and properties right here. So let's let's assume this pipe is made of some solid material that has a constant thermal conductivity. Right. So the solid material that makes up the wall of the pipe has some thermal conductivity, and the whole pipe basically has some length L. Let's say that there are two radii of the pipe. There's an inner radius, let's call it R sub I, and then an outer radius, R sub O. So, you know, there are basically two radii, um, and there we have it. So, you know, in some ways this is similar, you know, similar in many ways to the problem that we did before, where we have, you know, a wall. We have different temperatures on different sides of the wall and heat flows from the hot side to the cold side through that solid surface. But this gets a little bit trickier. Why might it get trickier? Um, well, this is tricky because the cross section changes with R. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can imagine you know, the the heat flowing, you know, this, this heat flow that's flowing outwards, you know, initially just has the very inside surface of the pipe to flow out of. But as it's flowing through the very outside of the pipe, it now actually has a lot more 
cross-sectional area to flow through. Right, so on the outside, it has more, more cross-sectional area when it's flowing through that last outer bit compared to the inside, less cross-sectional area. And, you know, what, what, we're, what we're looking to discover is, you know, what effect on, what effect does this have on our temperature as a function of position profile, right? Are we going to get a linear temper, you know, is temperature going to vary linearly from this point to this point, or is it going to be something more complicated? You know, what, what is this temperature profile going to be? Um, and how does this temperature profile result, uh, you know, how does this temperature profile um, relate to our overall goal of finding, finding out what this heat flow is in terms of this? So what are we going to do? We're going to find this temperature profile, this temperature as a function of R, um, as a step towards finding what this heat flow is going to be. So when we have things, you know, some things that are constant, some things that are not constant, um, you know, what's what's the deal? What's changing? What's different? So uh, Fourier's law, you know, we formulated it in a couple. Uh, we could formulate Fourier's law in in one of two ways. We could kind of formulate it in terms of the heat flow sort of way or the heat flux sort of way, right? So we said heat flux. We could say, you know, Q sub R is equal to minus K times dt dr. Or we could formulate it in terms of the heat flow way, which would be Q dot sub R is equal to minus K times cross-sectional area times dt dr. And both of these are correct. Which one of these is going to be most useful to us in this situation? Well, let's let's think a little bit about what's going on. So, well, uh, this differential equation is going to be solvable, really only if this or if one of these things is constant, right? So. Um, so if we think about, you know, what's going on with this system, um, which of the, take a moment now, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a spoiler alert, one of these is constant, the heat flow or the heat flux is constant. And you should pause and ponder, which is constant for this system. Let's assume this system is in steady state. So we have some this system in steady state. Which of these is going to be constant for this system in steady state? The heat flux or the heat flow? So for the for the wall problem, both of these you know were constant. But in this in this problem right here, only one of these is going to be constant. Which is it? Well, it turns out that it's the heat flow that is constant. This is the one that's constant for the system. And why? Well, what would happen if I had a different heat flow flowing into the inside of the wall of the pipe as compared to flowing out of the outside? You know, what if this heat flow were different? Well, if I had more heat flowing into the inner wall than flowing out of the outer wall, then I must have a black hole somewhere in the wall of my pipe that's just gobbling up energy. Or if I had more heat flowing out of the out, outside of the wall than, than heat flowing. If I have more watts coming out than going in, then I must have something generating heat inside the wall. And th that can't be true either, right? We can't get energy out of nowhere. You know, energy doesn't just appear in the wall of the pipe. So heat flow is constant. We don't necessarily know what it is, right? That's something we're trying to solve for. Um, but, but this is not constant. And why is this not constant? Well. Um, this this heat flow that is constant needs to be distributed or passed through a very small area at the beginning and a, a, uh, a much larger area at the outside. So the heat per unit area changes. 
So the heat flow per unit area, i.e. the heat flux, changes because cross-sectional changes with R, as, de as described right here. So what's the deal? We can use Fourier's law, we can treat QR as a constant, and we can maybe see, hey, you know, what can we get? You know, how can we go about sol uh, deriving this temperature distribution? All right, so let's, let's start formulating this differential equation. So I have my Q dot R, which is some as of yet unknown constant. We said K was a constant, so we have minus K. I'll leave cross-sectional area kind of as it is for now, and I have dt dr. I, I, I sort of already took the liberty of replacing these partial derivatives for ordinary derivatives by basically assuming is a function, by assuming temperature is a function of r only. So, so what might I, so how might I go about formulating this cross-sectional area? Well, the cross-sectional area is going to be different right here, but I kind of need to basically apply this kind of at any circular slice through here. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. Can I work this out? In terms of R and constants are in known constants. So go ahead, pause the video, see if you can work out what cross-sectional area is. So when I think about cross-sectional area, it's the cross-sectional area that is the surf is the area of the surface through which heat is flowing. So when I think about the surfaces through which heat is flowing, it's kind of these rectangles that are sort of wrapped around the center, and I can unwrap those rectangles. And this rectangle, if I unwrap it, is basically the circumference The circumference times the length, L, right? If I took if I took a, a a sort of sticker and wrapped it around it, and you know unwrapped it, you know one of the dimensions of that rectangular sticker would be the circumference, and the other would be the length, L, through which that heat is flowing. So the circumference times L, well, that's you know, this is basically equal to two, two pi r, times L. So that's our cross-sectional area. So what can I do? I can plug that in, and we see that as as I get you know from the from the inside of the pipe to the outside of the pipe, you know R is bigger at the outside than the inside. So my cross-sectional area is changing as I as I'm going from the inside to the outside of the pipe. So I have Q dot R is equal to minus K, or sorry, Q dot R is equal to minus K times two pi R L dt dr. So I now have this differential equation. I'm going to keep, treat q dot r as a constant. It's as of yet unknown, but it's a constant. I can take this differential equation. How am I to go about solving it? Well, I can separate variables and integrate. Pull this trick in the book. So I'll, I'll try to bring my dr over to one side, and I'll also bring my r over to that side as well. What's that going to look like? Um, well, uh, let's do it. So I'll bring, I'll have dt on one side. And also, I'm, I'm just going to keep all my constants with t. Um, so I'm going to have my, um, minus k times 2 pi times l. Um, divided by q dot r with my dt and that's going to be equal to 1 over r dr right so you can see if i like brought stuff over and to other sides of the you know to different sides of the equation i would end up with uh, with this with these integrals right here i can integrate both sides I could leave this as an, indef an indefinite integral as I wanted to, if I wanted to, you know, or, you know, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't really care that much about this temperature distribution. What I really care about is the inside temperature, the outside temperature, 
and its relationship to QR. So uh, if I don't care about deriving this temperature profile, I can just kind of cut to the chase and put R's that correspond to these various two points in temperature. So I could say, hey, I'm gonna do R from RI to RO, and I'm gonna do temp the temperature that corresponds to RI is gonna be T1, and the temperature that corresponds to RO is gonna be T2. So you know, instead of dealing with an indefinite integral and a constant of integration, I can just put corresponding limits of integration um, on both sides where the t's correspond to the particular r's and I could could integrate here. So I'll, uh, I'll leave the next steps to you, pause and ponder. Can you do can you do these integrals and apply these limits of integration? Well if you immigrate if you integrate one over r you get natural log of r. So the right hand side ends up being natural log of RO minus natural log of RI, which if you do your log rules, remember if you subtract logs, that's the equivalent of dividing things within the logs. So that would be natural log of RO over RI. And then if we get the left-hand side, um, you know all of these are constants that can be pulled out of the integral. So we get minus K Sorry, minus k times 2 pi l all over q dot r times t2 minus t1 right here. So I get this, this relationship right here. Or if I wanted to solve it for qr, I could basically say q, uh, q dot r is equal to the following. 2 pi L K T1 minus T2 all over natural log of RO over RI. And if you wanted to, you could check units to make sure that all of it works out. You can just take my word for it that we did it that we did it right. So what does this mean? This basically means, you know, if RO approaches RI, then I'm taking the natural log of one, which basically gets really close to zero. So as Ri approaches Ro, I'm getting, basically getting a thin-walled tube, and for a thin-walled tube, there's, um, you know, uh, there would be lots of heat flow through it. Uh, but as Ro gets much bigger than Ri, I'm dividing the numerator by a bigger number, so I'm getting less heat flow. Similarly, as the, as the thermal conductivity gets big, the heat flow gets big, or if the length of the tube gets big, then I'm just having more area for that heat to be flowing through. So it makes sense that heat flow scales up with length. It also makes sense that heat flow scales up with temperature difference as well. So this is the result. Awesome. Last but not least, I promised that I'd talk a little bit about thermal resistances. So let's think about thermal resistances now. So um, kind of what I was getting at with the end of this problem here, sometimes we don't, sometimes we care about the temperature distribution, but other times we don't care about the temperature distribution. Sometimes we're just basically saying, hey, I know what's going on in the inside, I know what's going on in the outside. I don't care exactly what's going on in between them. I just care about the relationship between a temperature difference and a flow rate. So if all you care about, I mean, hopefully you care about more than just that, um, but I mean, that's a value judgment that I'm not going to place on you. Uh, but, you know, if we care about thermal resistances, I'm just, I just, you know, sometimes all you care about is a relationship between a Q dot and a temperature difference, a delta T, right? So if all I care about is just this, the relationship between this Q dot and delta T, I, you know, I don't really care about a T of R. I just care about a temperature at one point, a temperature at another point, and the heat flow between them we can see some analogies here. So for this, for this circular pipe case, we had a heat flow that was proportional to a temperature difference. And if we go back even earlier, 
in the nodes to, to the heat flow through the wall. In that problem, I had a heat flow that was also proportional to a temperature difference. The constants were a little bit different in both of those two cases. But for both situations, I had this case where basically there was a temperature difference and a heat flow, and there was a relationship between these two. So in general, a thermal resistance is by definition the, the ratio between a delta T and a and a heat flow and you know it could be for example um, for you know for a slab you know the temperature difference is the temperature of the two walls and the heat flow is a Q sub X for the cylinder it would be the temperature difference between the inside and the outside and a Q sub R but in general the this uh, this idea of a thermal resistance is kind of defined this way and you know you can basically say hey you know this is analogous to the uh, a, an electrical resistance that's equal to a change in voltage divided by the current or analogous to a fluidic resistance that was defined as the change in pressure divided by the volumetric flow rate right so we can see there's some flow like quantity in the denominator of all these and some kind of difference or or kind of driving like quantity temperature voltage or pressure in the numerators of all of these so pause and ponder right now what is the thermal resistance for the um, for the wall for the heat flow through a wall and also then pause and ponder what is the thermal resistance for the um, flow, the radial flow through the wall of a pipe? So this is, I guess, the rectangular. What is the what is the thermal res resistance for the rectangular wall? What is the resistance through the um, pipe wall? So take a moment now, pause and ponder, try to get both of them. All right, so what are these thermal resistances? If you, if, you, if you look back in the notes and kind of rearrange some terms, the thermal resistance for the rectangular wall is proportional to the thickness and inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity in the cross-sectional area, right? So, So it makes sense, the higher the thermal conductivity, the lower the resistance is gonna be. So good insulators have a small K and a big thermal resistance. Similarly, if I, take, if I look at my glove, I want my glove to have a high thermal resistance. So I want my gloves to be nice and thick with a nice big L, which makes it really difficult to point and explain things in lecture. Um, uh, and in this sort of tiptoeing analogy, I want to try to maintain as little contact as possible to have that heat flow through, to try to have as little cross-sectional area in order to keep my thermal resistance big. And if you do it in terms of the pipes, this thermal resistance is equal to um, the natural log of RO over RI divided by 2 pi K L. Where basically the longer the pipe is, the more area there is to heat to, for heat to flow through, right? L means something different for the pipe case versus the rectangular wall case, right? In this case, it's the pipe. Um, this is the pipe length, where it's basically saying, "Hey, you know, my long pipe, I'm just stretching out more more area for heat to flow through," whereas in the wall case. Whereas in the wall case, L was making it a thicker, a thicker wall that it had to go through. So kind of opposite effect there. Um, this is still thermal conductivity. So a high thermal conductivity for the pipe is also associated with a low resistance. Similarly, if I make the out outer wall thicker or the inner wall thinner, that makes the, the resistance go up or down uh, respectively. So. Uh, this is this is this ideal with thermal resistances, and um, 
and you can um, you can proceed with them to kind of get a shortcut between heat flows and delta t's. So hopefully this was a useful lecture in terms of introducing some heat transfer and these various concepts that we talked about here, in particular Fourier's law and thermal resistances and deriving temperature profiles. So thanks for paying attention, thanks for watching, and good luck with your study of fluid mechanics. Take care. Nope, good luck with your study of heat transfer. Oh, we're on to a new topic now. Ha, I'll need a new outro. Cheers. <laughs>